welcome to the webinar. We're going to be talking about kickstarting your data governance program today. So on the call with me today, I have Rob Aldrich. He's a senior consultant from Yellowfin. Uh, do you want to say hi, Rob? Good afternoon, everybody. And myself, Andreas Faganov. I'm a technical consultant at Yellowfin as well. So feel free to follow us on uh, Twitter or connect on LinkedIn. We're going to be your data stewards for today. Also, just a quick note, uh, the webinar is going to be recorded, so you should get an email later with the recording. So the agenda for today is the following. Uh, first, we're going to look at what data governance is, why it's important, how we do it in the industry, and how software can actually help us achieve what we want. And leaving some time finally at the end for a discussion and question and some question time. So what is data governance? Rob, um, is, is someone trying to impose order and restrict me from playing Sudoku in the Excel report? Is that what it's all about? Uh, a little bit, Andrew. Um, essentially, it's, uh, I'll let you answer it, but um, it's putting some controls and rigor around some of the data. And uh, we're going to talk about how a BI tool um, can actually be used to support your data governance process. I see, I see. So we've seen the shift from the kind of IT-based reporting into business user-based reporting. We've seen the move from the spreadsheets into BI platforms, which kind of triggered a shift in behavior, and it requires some shift in, in behavior, that we're, we're kind of prompted to think about decision-making as, as a structured process. So which kind of uh, makes data governance look as an organizational methodology in a broad sense. And why not, if it is an organizational methodology full of principles and all these other rules and things like that and, and, and practices, why not use an, a, an a BI govern or rather a BI tool as a, to support us on this journey to, to provide data governance for the analytics, for the analytics areas. So we're going to be focusing today on talking about decision making as a process, basically. We found the following definition on, on, tech, on tech Target, and kind of the official version is the data governance refers to the overall management of the availability, usability, integrity, and security of the data employed in an enterprise. So let's try to deconstruct it a bit more, see what it means. So all these things on the left column uh, and how they apply to the things on the right column is basically what we're talking about across the entire organization. So by the looks of it, it's not just a single technology product or it's a, a project. Um, it's a collection of rules and processes and the ways how they affect the creation integration of data. So on the right, we have all these things that we can do with the data and as we know, data is what we use to make the decisions. So if we were to rephrase it more concisely, how can we use, like, what are we going to be looking at today is how can we use BI to improve the quality and reliability of decision making in our organization? To answer that, we're going to look into two main parts, the data, prepar the data preparation and the delivery to the business. And all great problems start with the why. Why is it important and why do it early? In this photo, we have a house in Russia, which uh, was reported to be one of the world's tallest wooden buildings. It was constructed over a period of approximately 15 years and it was ordered to be demolished by the court in 2009. Rob, does that remind you of any data architectures that you've seen? Not not with our current customers, Andrew, but I've certainly seen this before. That's good to hear. So here we have a depiction of growing and accumulating risk that comes from daily decisions that have very little effect to the bottom line, which is the small daily decisions, but they'll all roll up to significant risks to business and people's careers when it comes to regulatory reports, hence the big square especially once we start making decisions on data, which turns out to be unreliable. And once the trust is lost, it's very hard to regain it. So what can we do to stop the chaos? 
luckily it's not a new area it's not it's not a new topic there's been a lot of research and there are many existing practices that exist and we've done uh, we've participated in a study with uh, with Barry Devlin he's um, and his consulting firm he's uh, one of the founders of the data warehousing industry where the, the first architecture he's proposed for um, for data warehousing was in 1985 and later was published in the book in 1997 so he outlines the three kind of main cornerstones for successful BI for successful BI data governance these are decision making as a process which we already kind of had a quick look at decision uh, sorry number two is the doing it in a single integrated platform and the third one being the adaptive um, decision cycle so we're going to look into these in more detail but before we do look into them in more detail let's revisit quickly what is the difference between information and data so as you know this, uh, we make the decisions based on information and information is essentially data put into context context either being personal knowledge of the analysts or the metadata stored in the reporting databases. So the role of the BI governance in this case is to ensure the validity and the existence of, of this metadata for us to be able to form the decision to make the accurate information. All right, now let's, we, we've got this confirmed. Let's have a look at the three cornerstones. The first one, being decision making is a process. As you can see on the diagram here, we have it kind of an, a loop of some kind. We have the first step being the ingestion and consolidation of data. This is, this is what, uh, what includes the data warehousing, data lake, gathering of data and storing it according to the laws that are applicable to the organization. So first of all, you need to know what information you're storing. Then the second step is acce uh, accessing uh, and preparation of the data then analysis and insight, which is where you get probably most value out of BI systems, and then moving into decision making and how do you actually use the BI platform to bring that insight into action, which then completes back and goes back into accessibility. So it's, it's all kind of a cycle. The second one being a single integrated platform is quite self-explanatory. Apart from having less complexity trying to manage multiple systems, you also have complete data and activity lineage. You have um, single and multiple versions of the truth in the same platform, and then you have secure and consistent environments, which make it, make, make it easier to manage. So in terms of, for the third one, the adaptive decision cycle. We can, in an organization, we can make decisions in two main ways, ad hoc and formal. Ad hoc allows us cre uh, creative use of data and uncovering insights. And formal usually implies a governed controlled environment. So to get the best results, it's possible to combine these two into a cycle, the decision cycle, which kind of uh, presented on the diagram on the right. So here you can see there are three main stages. The exploration stage, which is a complete loop between an event and an action. And just to note as well, this is an individual decision-making cycle, and, and like one person's. Then we have the second phase being the cultivation stage, which is asks for some peer review, and then you're still able to get the feedback and, and improve on that. And the third phase being the grounding phase is where you, you share the findings with the wider organization and, and the other stakeholders in the business. So now that we've seen how the technology agnostic guiding, uh, we've seen the technology agnostic guiding principles, now, now let's see how the software can actually help us achieve it. And Rob is going to take us through the steps at, uh, at setting up the access restrictions at the data source level, configuring controls while allowing data exploration for the users, and also finally gluing it back together with some collaboration features to complete the loop of our decision-making cycle. Thank you, Andrew. So the scenario we're going to use today to actually illustrate how these various aspects can be implemented in a BI platform is a, a sales report. 
uh, more specifically, a commission report. So something a sales director or sales manager would use to understand revenue for a particular period, uh, gross profit, margin, and finally, uh, commission calculations for the, the sales team. So this is a, a fairly sort of standard um, procedure that a lot of sales organizations uh, use. So uh, these metrics have been established, but you still need to have metrics that have been agreed to and approved uh, and approved organization wide. So that's why data governance in this case is important. So let me just uh, flick over into a yellow fin. Just log in here. So Rob, are you going to start with the the what we can do with the data source first? Yes, yeah, so right. I'll, I'll show you the data source. Um, but this is the end end result, and I guess this is what the sales director is using to make his decisions. So let's go back to the data source, as Andrew mentioned. So from a data source perspective, you basically need to ensure you've got trusted data. So Andrew mentioned getting the data into a data warehouse or a data lake, or in fact, it could be a transactional system. But you need to make sure that data is trustworthy. So to ensure that, you need to secure it. So there's a number of ways that we could do that within Yellowfin. The first is to actually uh, apply security to the data source connection itself. So this ensures that it can't be altered, it can't be repointed, uh, the tables can't be changed. From a, uh, a BI perspective, it's important to know that the data you're actually using to report from is reliable. So you can apply security to the data source connection. The next level is all about content access. So this is very uh, pertinent for you know, privacy related data. So you've got sensitive customer data, for instance. You want to ensure that people in your organization only see what they need to see. Um, in, a, in a sales sort of a scenario, probably not as critical, but certainly with um, GDPR in the uh, uh, media recently, this, this is actually very important. So you can control what people see as far as uh, the data at the data source level. The other aspect that's controlled at the data source level is how the data source is used. So here you can control things like whether you want it to be available for external broadcasts. So this is sending information outside the organization. Again, if it's sensitive data, you do not want it to leave you know, your organization and be distributed in uncontrolled formats like, you know, for instance, uh, uh, Word documents, Excel files, PDFs, etc. So you can turn that off and on um, at the data source connection level. And finally, um, subscribing. You may not want to make this data source available for people to subscribe to. So um, basically, if, if content's getting published and it's of a secure nature, you may want to turn this off. Finally, from an audit perspective, it's, it's important to know how your data source is being used, you know, what reports, what dashboards are being created on my data source. So this basically allows you to understand um, all, the, all the views and reports that have been created from the data source. Okay, so moving on to the metadata level. So Andrew mentioned uh, one source of knowledge uh, in the organization's so either personal knowledge or, or what's come out of the metadata layer. So within Yellowfin, that's actually controlled by the view. So let me show you an example of that. So I've essentially created a view over that data source connection. And what the view does is give me the ability to get consistent metrics and dimensions across to the organization. So let me just open the view up. So while I'm opening it, it's also alerting me to the fact that this view is actually in production. It's been consumed by my uh, report authors and um, business users. So what this allows me to do is enforce some uh, approval workflow on it. So I can't change the view that's in production now without uh, explicitly uh, getting approval to, to do so. So this, again, 
is that, uh, that process that Andrew talked about. So in this case, I'll, I'll edit it just to show you what's in it. So this is very simple. Uh, your views certainly in, in, in your environment are going to be a lot more complex, but this is trying to illustrate for, for this scenario just the essential two tables that we need. The first one here is basically a, a transaction table that's got all my orders. Um, it's got the obviously the dates, the products, uh, the sales reps that have actually uh, sold it. And what I've done is actually joined it to a, a budget, a sales budget. So this has basically got uh, the different targets, the bonus targets, the commission rates, um, all the aspects of, uh, in an organization, what you use to calculate commissions. So on top of that, I've actually created some, some metrics. So these are the metrics I uh, showed you briefly on top of the dashboard, things like um, total revenue, uh, commission, um, gross profit, margin, etc. Now, different organizations calculate these differently. So what you want to do is have a central place where all this information, all these calculations are actually captured, agreed to, and approved, um, and controlled. So this is all locked down. Once you've uh, you know, had your workshops, etc., you understand from finance how they do revenue recognition, all those sort of aspects in a sales organization. Once you've got that, you create the calculation once and you lock it down. So the other thing you can do in the, the view area is also enforce the use of filters, so mandatory filters. So the example here is it's, it's, a, it's an order type environment, so they're, they're basically selling widgets. You want to ensure that you're only paying commission to uh, transactions or, or sales that have actually been completed or, shift or shipped. So I can actually create a calculated filter here that makes sure that anybody that uses this view to create a commission report, to do calculations on commission, use this filter, and I've actually made it a mandatory filter. So that ensures, again, the consistency on uh, organization-wide that can be used to uh, make decisions. Okay, so that was at the metadata or view level. Let me jump back into uh, the actual dashboard itself. Thanks, Rob. So was that actually, so this was now what you were showing us, does that relate to the data exploration level, but in a controlled, governed environment? Is that, is that what this exactly. is about? Yes, so that view can actually be used to create reports. So uh, once a data source and view has been locked down, um, me as a sales manager or you know, one of my analysts as a, uh, a report author knows that the reports are creating, the metrics in there, all the calculations, actually makes sense organization-wide. They can be com com compared uh, correctly. Um, so it, it makes it reliable and, uh, you know, enforces some, um, I guess, structure. And, you know, ultimately it's all about trust and engagement. Yeah, cool, cool. Let me go back. What, about, what about collaboration? So can, can we do like peer review of insights and provide feedback to other parts of the business? Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, in this dashboard here, I could uh, switch to you know, the, the tabular mode to actually get more detail around this. Um, I can run various uh, algorithms around it. Uh, if I feel some, uh, I get some sort of interest or um, there's some analytics that I want to explore further, I can actually share that to uh, other members of the organization. But specifically, if we're talking about data governance, um, one aspect is data quality. What we can actually use the collaboration features for is to highlight and get action on data quality issues. So for instance, this last line item here, um, we notice has got a commission of $0. You know, that may or may not be correct. But I can actually kick off a, a workflow and um, you know, create a collaboration event so it can be actioned and explored properly. So I can, you know, firstly create a comment. Um, I can address the comment to someone. So maybe I want to get the Data Quality Council to look at it. I can, you know, put some text in there for the comment. I can attach a screenshot or I can attach the chart itself. 
um, or even even external sort of files to support the the, the inquiry. So it might be a, uh, you know a file of commission rates or something like that. But in this case, I'll just uh, do a quick screenshot, just highlighting the fact there's a zero for for Taylor. I can put some sort of annotations on the chart as well, just to further highlight it. And save it. So when the a member of the Data Quality Council logs in, uh, they'll actually see a message in their activity stream highlighting the fact there's an inquiry or a comment on this particular chart. So they can action it, reply to it, and basically close that loop off um, all the way from you know me seeing something in the data to questioning it to actually sending it off and uh, you know validating if this is a data quality issue or maybe it's just a uh, you know a no normal sort of operation where uh, the commission is correct. So, Fantastic. Thanks, Rob. Okay, back to you, Andrew. Yeah, cool. Well, this, this completes our presentation part, and uh, Rob, Rob has answered all of my questions. Now we open the floor to the questions from the audience. And I think we'd like to start off with um, probably quite a common question is, how would you actually go about getting started with the data governors? system and like how would you get it started? I'll have a go at this one, Andrew. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head when you actually mentioned uh, data-driven or decision as a process um, culture of the organization. So to make you know effective decisions, you've got to ensure you've got the right data. And data governance is all about that. So it's, it's a, that whole cycle of ensuring that you understand you know, where the data come from comes from, lock down the data at, the, at various levels, ensure you have consistency, and it's, it's iterative and it's organizational wide. So uh, a tool, a BI platform can, can certainly help with that, can actually help lock down the data, uh, make, making sure you have uh, trusted data to make decisions. Okay, yeah, and I think I would add to that, that as a starting point actually, you have to understand and lay out the organizational inputs and outputs, what decisions are you making and what data are you basing it on. As long as you have it under, uh, understood and laid out, you can easily control which components play which part of the process and it becomes easier to see which, which software has to be responsible for different parts of the process. All right, so we have some questions here. First one, um, are there any audit logs or reports in Yellowfin? I'm guessing like audit reports. You want to take that one, Rob? Yes. So Yellowfin as a platform can be used to report on itself. So you can always check uh, from a, um, a data source perspective which ones are being used. So you can ensure that um, content is, 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 is fresh and you're updating it. So let me just show you a sample of the admin dashboard from the audit uh, reports. So this one uh, goes through all your reports, tells you uh, how long they've taken to run, etc. Specifically, you can actually find out which data sources and views are actually being hit or used. Um, and from here, you can sort of understand the profile of your, of your, of your users and what, what reports and what content is being used in their daily uh, decision-making process. Okay, cool. And are these available out of the box? Or? Yes, this is, this is uh, downloadable from our marketplace. Cool. cool. Second question we got, um, what is the difference between data governance and data quality? I can, I can, I can uh, take that one and okay. feel free to add if you have anything, Rob. So, well, the way we've kind of discussed it in the presentation as well, data quality is an aspect of data governance and 
data quality is something a bit more specific with you actually referring to data. While data governance, even though it's got data in the name, it's more usually referring to the information and the, the whole process around how it's, the organization behaves around the, the data that it uses. So it's, uh, yeah, it's not exactly comparable. Do you have anything to add, Rob? No, that that's uh, pretty much sums it up, I think. Line. Yep. Cool. All right, let's, let's give it a minute to see if there are any other questions. And they, yeah, so feel free to type the, if you've got any questions in that little question box and we'll add them to the discussion. While, while we wait, um, just like to mention that after the webinar, you'll get an email maybe not immediately, but uh, a day or so after with the recording, as well as the document that we're actually referring to with the, the data governance study done with Barry Devlin. So you'll, you'll, get, you'll get a PDF version of that. All right, well, I don't see any more questions, Rob. Do you wanna go to the last, last slide? Thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. Uh, been a pleasure. Looking forward to seeing you again. And feel free to reach out to us uh, through any like social media. And yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Found anything useful? If you have any questions, send it through. And yeah, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.